Good morning and welcome to those of you here on site and to those of you joining us online, a big welcome to you as well. And Holy Spirit, we want to welcome you here this morning as well. Just know that we are open to you and how you want to move this morning. Uh, we welcome you here. Would you stand with us, those of you who are in the room, and let's uh, worship together and sing out to our God who deserves our praise. together, I wanted to read a Psalm 34 that reminds us of God's goodness to us. It says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. 
Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you, his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. Let's continue to worship together.
things of earth stand next to him like a candle to the sun unfailing father what compares to his great love
Our Father, we thank you that you are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you pursue us, God, even though you are beyond anything we can imagine. Compared to the Son, God, you are so magnificent, God, we can't even understand it, that you sent your Son to pursue us in your love. God, would you continue to show us your great love for us and that our response would be praise. God, would you be enthroned on our praises. We love you. We look to you. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Good morning, Hillside. Love you guys. Wonderful to see all of you here in the auditorium and those who are joining us online. Make sure you take a moment to say hello to others online. And can we thank Laura and the team for the gift of that worship they just let us in? Just really incredible. And, um, you know, worship is an opportunity for us to forget about what's wrong with the world, a lot of the struggles and pain and world going on in the world today, and remember what is right about God, that He is a good God and He loves us. And you know, the reality is God has saved us in order to serve. Do you ever think about why we're not in heaven right now? Um, because God has us here for a reason, that we want to be a force for good, to reveal His love, His kindness, his restorative activity in the world. And that's exactly what took place yesterday. I just want to give a huge shout out to everyone who is part of the Love Moncton Day. Um, yeah, it was just absolutely fantastic. And every cause, I often say that every cause needs a champion and every champion needs a team. And so big shout out to Pastor Renee, to the Love Moncton team, and the 78 volunteers who are part of extending love and kindness beyond the walls of our church yesterday. Just some incredible things happened. Um, let me just share some of them. Yesterday, there was a roof put on at Camp Wildwood. There were bunks that were painted there and other uh, restorative work there. There was a garden transformed at Beaverbrook School. There was pavement that was swept, and I can attest to that with the way my muscles feel today, uh, helping to clear the way for some play areas at, Bever, uh, at Beaverbrook School. There was a closet, uh, clothing closet organized there. There were a number of houses cleaned. There was a play set assembled and donated to a family, and much, much more. There was over $6,000 donated to the lunch uh, snack program at Beaverbrook School. And that means that every, every child at Beaverbrook will have their lunch and their snack provided for an entire week. And then also there's some uh, extra on top of that. So just really a tremendous opportunity. And, uh, you know, we're blessed to be a blessing. And so to be able to go out and have fun doing it was a lot of fun. So thank you, everybody, who was part of that uh, opportunity yesterday. Now, next week, we're really excited about, we're excited about Love Day, but we're also excited next Sunday, we finally get to launch our Home Point Conference. It's been postponed the last couple of years because of COVID. It's taking place next Sunday, and I want you to check out this um, video uh, to help you appreciate what this is going to be about. In our session, we're going to strive to share how we bring faith into everyday activities. Come on, moms and dads. We want the best for our teenagers. So they want us to talk about raising boys. Seven years? No. No. <laughs> Not about seven years. Seven. I, I was, was a single, single dad. dad. No, I, I was, was a single, a single dad, dad for about, about seven years. years. What are you going to talk about? Raising boys. Raising boys. Yeah, actually, you know what? I'm probably going to talk a bit more about what not to do right. when raising boys. I've, I'm really good at that. You have girls in your home. We look forward to interacting with you at our breakout session. And during the session, I want to talk to you about how we need to be very intentional in pointing our kids towards Jesus. So we want to invite you to the workshop at Home Point Conference on June 5th 
Well, we'll be sharing about single parenting and blended families. Home Point is all about integrating faith into your home. We are so excited to bring this conference to you. We've been wanting to do it for a couple years and there's several breakouts all about if you have sons and daughters, teenagers, early beginnings, grandparenting, and single parent blended families. We just want to be helpful to you. I think they should come to our session. I think they should come to both of our sessions. I think, yeah, both sessions. Both sessions. Yes. Like the first and the second one. Yeah. Make sure you're at my session. And come, come to, to our, our workshop. Come to our. Come to our ours. workshop. Come back. No, seriously, make sure you're at my session. Come to our session. Our session. Our session. Come to our session. Come to our session. Home point. Let's be intentionally intentional about bringing faith into our home. Sign up now for June 5th. All right, so we're looking forward to that. It's next Sunday, right after church. It's a four-hour event, begins with lunch. Lunch is provided, but you need to sign up, okay? So make sure you go to our events page. Everything happening at Hillside is on our events page. We need you to seize the day and to sign up. There are six breakouts, and you get to choose two of those. And um, there's a great one on grandparenting as well. Um, I want to just a little plug for that one as well. Uh, but you want to sign up uh, for that event so we know that you're coming, and it's going to be just a fantastic day uh, next Sunday from 11.30 to about 3.30 um, in the afternoon. Also want to mention that right after that Sunday is the next Sunday is June the 12th, and we're really excited about our spring baptism celebration. And we already have a number of children and youth and adults who are signed up and going to be learning about taking that next step, but it's still not too late to seize the day. And if God's been prompting your heart to take that next step of, of baptism, again, go to the events page and sign up. I'll be hosting a Zoom class on Wednesday night. Pastor Roger has a class for students coming up, and, and if you have a child who uh, you want to have a conversation about that, let us know um, and sign up on the events page um, on our web website. That's going to be an incredible morning uh, taking place. Well, you know, when we talk, we use the word church. We say Hillside, you know, church. We often think of a church of a building or the church is a program. And it may involve a building or it may involve a program. But ultimately, the church is the people of God. It's the family of God. And, you know, as, as a community of faith, we want to be the most loving most encouraging, the most uh, caring that we can possibly be, and we're so grateful for our care ministry, the incredible work that Lil Harris and, and her team do, and particularly the last couple of years with COVID and all the disruptive challenges that that have brought. And I know that during COVID, the last couple of years journey, some of you have experienced loved ones who were hospitalized. And it was really, really hard because you weren't able to go and visit them. I also know that there's a lot of people in our Hillside family who actually lost a loved one during the last couple of years. And it was just so hard, the inability to have funerals and gather together and things like that. And someone very special in our Hillside family uh, experienced some of that loss um, during COVID. And in the midst of it all was a remarkable example of faith and love and joy in Christ. And we're so grateful for Elizabeth Jelly and her beloved husband, Swaby. And I'd like you to just check out this, uh, care, this story that will be a blessing to you um, to hear what Elizabeth has to share about their journey. Of course, I miss him there in his wheelchair, looking out over the city, watching TV. Um, but I couldn't wish him back. My husband and I grew up and brought up our family on Prince Edward Island. Um, we had four sons. My husband and I were both teachers and I was fortunate enough to be able to stay home for 17 years with our boys. Very involved in the church, first in O'Leary PEI and then uh, in Summerside. Baptist Church. My husband did everything in the church from being chair of the building committee to deacon to treasurer to climbing on his belly up in the attic looking to find leaks when he was chair of property. 
uh, he never minded doing anything like that. In 1999, um, they were giving uh, retirement packages to make room for new teachers. And at the very same time, the opportunity for a business opportunity came up here in Moncton. But when we started that summer in 1999, we started going to Hillside, even though we still kept our membership in Summerside Church. And the people were always friendly. We knew a lot of people. Uh, Reverend Max Nesbitt, who had been pastor at Hillside, uh, was our pastor in Summerside at the time at the time we were married, and he would have baptized me. In the fall of um, 1999, um, my husband um, was at a, with me at our teacher's Christmas dinner, and it was the teachers he had taught with, and um, all of a sudden, he couldn't speak. It turned out he had suffered a stroke, and it was a blood clot. Doctors had said there was nothing in medical history that would have predicted that he would have a stroke, but he did. The speech was affected, his mobility was affected, and at that time, I guess still thinking, oh, it will come back. Uh, but anyway, we lived with the reality of it. So uh, that was sort of the beginning of a grief journey then that you had to learn um, to deal with things that I hadn't dealt with before. But immediately, people came from the church, from the guys from the school, came up and built a ramp in the garage so we could bring him home for Christmas. There were, there were valleys, but there were many, many, many more peaks. As some of you remember, my husband was uh, the last few years when he was completely confined to a wheelchair. But since he had the stroke, with the support of our family, we visited Europe, we saw Paris, the Swiss Alps. My husband got sick and went to the hospital on April 3rd, so very near the first part of the pandemic. And it was difficult because um, we couldn't go with him. You know, the paramedics were taking him there and they said, we're his caregivers now. But I worried about that because I was used to being his, his speech. But you know, God sent someone from her church to work in that unit. He'd let him face, she'd FaceTime with us here. This lady from Hillside, and I'll never forget that. Since we moved permanently to Moncton Hillside, Pastor Jerry was there for virtual visits. Uh, Lil in the care committee, everyone has been so wonderful taking care of us and me, even in the pandemic. I feel comfort in knowing that God's taking care of him. Much better than I could. Elizabeth, <clears throat> we thank God for Swaby and just what a blessing they uh, continue to be in our Hillside family, and they both were teachers, and they have taught us a lot in their journey of faith and faithfulness and joy in Christ, regardless of the circumstances. And um, I want everyone to know that on Sunday night, June the 12th, so <clears throat> that's like two weeks from this Sunday, we're actually hosting <clears throat> a special memorial service for anyone in our Hillside family who has lost someone during the last two years, during the pandemic. And um, we know many of you have let us know uh, and have confirmed that you're planning to be here. And we don't want to leave anybody behind. So if you have lost a loved one um, during the last two years uh, within our Hillside family, we'd, we'd love to, if you, you would like to uh, have their, a photo submitted and a short little excerpt about them, please go to our events page 
on our website to this memorial service. It's going to be Sunday night, June 12th, 6 p.m. All The church family, we're all invited to attend and, and to enjoy this time together and remember. Um, but if you would like to uh, have your loved one remember, please let us know, and we would really appreciate that. We don't want to leave anybody behind. Well, friends, today it's week three in our teaching series, Monsters We Tolerate. We're so excited. It's going to be a really challenging practical message by Pastor Renee today, and as she gets ready to come up and bring the message, um, check this out. Good morning. Don't you always feel like a scary movie's gonna start after that sermon trailer? <laughs> yeah, me too. We're in week three of this sermon series, The Monsters We Tolerate, and it's about the seven deadly sins. So these are the seven things that can take us off track from living the life we've wanted, the, the best life that God has for us. And so if you picture your journey with God uh, like a trail, a hiking trail or a race, these are the seven things that can take us out and mean we don't finish the race. And we've already covered pride and lust, and this week is an interesting one. We're talking about sloth or laziness. So let's meet the mighty sloth. Isn't this animal, the three-toed sloth, cute? I think it would be a great pet, an easy pet to keep, because if it escaped out the door, you'd be able to catch it. No problem. The sloth's entire lifestyle is about expending as little energy as possible, because it can take them up to two weeks to digest a single meal. And they move so little that algae actually grows in their fur. And the mighty sloth is only 25% muscle. 25% of their body weight is muscle. You know, just enough to get food to its mouth. <laughs> and the mighty sloth moves at the speed of four meters per minute. But if you threaten it, it can go the whopping speed of 4.5 meters per minute. <laughs> so, let me ask, why did the sloth cross the road? Nobody knows, he's still trying. <laughs> or did you hear what happened when the sloth got mugged by snails? The police officer so showed up and asked the sloth, what happened? And the sloth said, I don't know, it all happened so fast. So the animal might be cute and the joke's funny, but we're warned that sloth, this deadly sin, can really take us out of the race. For us five-toed creatures, it can be deadly. Sloth is like dust. You don't have to do anything and it accumulates and multiplies. So last weekend, we had some young guests in and we were playing hide and seek and the young girl came out from under one of our beds covered in dust. I don't know how that happened in my home, but sloth is like that. You don't have to do anything, and suddenly it's there. And you think, wait a second, I thought I was on the right path, doing the right thing. I've been avoiding lust, avoiding pride, avoiding greed, and what? You're accusing me of being a sloth? Because sloth is all about inactivity. All the other seven deadly sin sins are active. They're things we do or we think that can take us off the trail of following God. But sloth is different. It comes from inactivity. We don't have to do anything and we're taken out of the race. In this deadly sin, it's marked by inactivity. It's you sitting down in the middle of the race and letting everyone else go by. If I had to mark sloth by one word, I'd mark it by the word whatever. 
Now, I grew up in the 80s and the 90s, and my generation invented the word whatever. In fact, we were so lazy, we shortened the word to whatever. <laughs> in fact, we were even lazier than, the na- than that. We didn't want to you know, strain our vocal muscles, so we came up with a sign language and would just go, usually accompanied by an eye roll. So sorry to my mom and my dad. But talk about slothful. And so sloth, the sin of sloth, is less about laziness and more about this attitude of whatever, this attitude of apathy. It's apathetic when you say, I don't care. Maybe in your job you start saying, oh, it's just a job. It's just a paycheck, or you start daydreaming in your job about having a different job and stop giving your best where you are. It's when we stop caring, and, and maybe in our family we, we say, hey, we're going to all get together the table for supper next week, and next week never comes. Or you say, oh, I'll get back to walking and exercise, exercising when the weather's warmer, and, well, newsflash, the weather's warmer. It's marked by when you say, oh, I'll come back to church once Easter comes. And then you realize Easter was over a month ago. It's when you say to family or friends, oh, we'll get together when work slows down. And now they're asking you to put on a name tag at the door. It's marked by apathy. Are you starting to get the picture of why sloth can be so deadly, slow, deadly to our relationship with God, our relationships with each other? This term, sloth, actually comes from our early desert fathers and mothers. In the fourth century, these are the folks that gathered in the desert to dedicate themselves to that community, dedicate themselves to prayer and scripture. And they're the first ones that put together this list of the deadly sins. And they considered sloth the deadliest of sins that could take any of us out because it's so sneaky. And they deemed if you could overcome this sin of sloth, it would help you overcome all the other sins on the list. And they noticed something in their early recruits. When they came into the desert, they started with great zeal, but then a few weeks in, they lost their zeal and they started to get apathetic. And they named it in the desert something called acedia that comes from the Greek and means lack of care. They also called it the noonday demon. The noonday demon. Have you ever been struck by the noonday demon? When it's hot out, the sun is at its highest, but your energy is at its lowest, and time just doesn't seem to move at all? Have you ever been struck by the noonday demon in the middle of a meeting, in the middle of a church service, uh, in the middle of a job, in the middle of a marriage, in the middle of your family? the noonday demons. It feels like nothing changes. You keep trying, but it doesn't seem to make a difference. You wonder what the point is. Your prayers don't feel like they're being heard, and apathy seeps in. One preacher described it this way. A general weariness sets in. Everything becomes burdensome, tedious, and dull. Things that formerly fired us up with zeal seem intolerably stupid. Prayer gets stuck like dry peanut butter on the roof of the mouth. We become discouraged with ourselves, impatient with others, indifferent to everything around us. The fathers and mothers of the desert called this spiritual ailment acedia. So where has the noonday demon struck in your life? You know, as I think of the last two years, I think this one has all seeped in to our lives a little bit. COVID knocked us out of our routines. It divided us in new ways. We're afraid to do anything, to bring anything up, to speak up. We're afraid to work with zeal because we might get knocked back down again. Or maybe in your own home, apathy has snuck in. The noonday demon, and you thought, oh, we'll just be a Disney Plus watching family now. When you used to go out for walks, when you used to say hi to neighbors or volunteer in the community or get dressed in non-pajamas and all come together to church on a Sunday. 
And then there's all the news. We want to care, but the news can be so negative, can't it? Think of just the war in Ukraine. When it first start, started, we all cared. We all were like, we have to pray. We have to do something. We have to donate to the Canadian Baptist Ministries Relief Fund. But now it's been going on three months and six days, and we don't know how to care. Injustice in this world, it can be so overwhelming, we don't know how to care. And sloth is this creepy one. Apathy seeps in through little crevices, and before we know it, we realize, uh, I think I used to care. What, what happened? Well, Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, was struggling deeply. He was struggling at his darkest hour when he knew that the cross was just hours away. And in his darkest hour, he asked his friends to please stay close. He said, can I count on you? Will you stay close in this hour where I'm in torment? And Jesus couldn't have slept if he wanted to then at that hour. And he wanted his friends close for comfort. And Matthew 26, 40 tells us what happened. It says, then he, Jesus, returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Ouch. Jesus said, couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? And this scene repeats itself twice. Jesus' friends weren't just lazy in that moment. They were apathetic. They didn't care enough about Jesus, about their master, to stay awake with him. And Jesus wanted them. He needed them to care. And they wouldn't or they couldn't even stay awake. Sloth is falling asleep at the wheel. Sloth is walking away or being unconcerned when you're the one that's supposed to care. Did that ever happen in your life? The people that should have cared about you didn't have the time, didn't have their priorities right, didn't care. Maybe it was a mom or a dad, a guardian, a friend, a pastor, a teacher someone that was supposed to be there for you, and instead they ignored you or were apathetic. Well, may you know that Jesus cares, that Jesus sees, that Jesus knows, and he has all the time in the universe for you. He loves you deeply, and our Jesus is never apathetic towards you. He loves you. And let's just acknowledge, as Peter Greff says, the workaholic may be as guilty as the couch potato because their constant activity keeps them from attending to the most important things in life. Control your schedule or your schedule will control you. Apathy doesn't necessarily mean you're lazy. It could just mean that you've become uncaring about the things that really matter most in life. God and family and relationships. And you've buried yourself in other things like work or hobbies or the art of ignoring or apps or games. And don't be fooled. Those around you know that you've stopped caring. And sloth hurts our relationships with others, our relationships with God in this way, and it cuts deep. And Jesus knew, Jesus knows. Jesus told us a par parable where we see apathy at work. You can follow along in your Bibles on the app or on the screen. It's in Luke 10, starting at verse 25. And this parable will be familiar to a number of you, but just ask Jesus to help you hear it afresh what he has for you today. It says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Or we could say, for our purposes today, what do I have to do to stay on the path, stay on the Jesus way? What is written in the law, Jesus replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, 
A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and he saw him, and he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have." Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Do you notice the slothfulness in this parable? It's not of the couch potato variety. It's of the apathy variety, the I don't care variety, the priest and the Levite who passed by on the other side. The core of the sin of sloth is I can't be bothered or I don't care enough to be bothered. The priest and the Levite, they thought they had valid reasons not to get involved. They thought, I don't have to get involved in this messy situation. It would make me, as a priest, as a Levite, too unclean. And he's not one of us. He's too different. So I'm not responsible. And they decided, it's too inconvenient, and I'm too busy. I'm going to pass by on the other side. But notice the good Samaritan. He's the one that allowed himself to care, allowed himself to be moved and have compassion on this poor man. It's the opposite of apathy, the opposite of sloth. It's a zeal to make sure this poor man was looked after. And not only did this good Samaritan do what was expected, he did even more. He bandaged him and and poured on the antiseptics of wine and oil, but he didn't stop there. He went even further. He put the man on his own donkey and he took him to an inn, but he didn't stop there. He went even further. He stayed at the inn himself and looked after this man, but he didn't stop there. He went even further. He took out his own money and he paid the innkeeper and then he said to the innkeeper, will you look after him? But he didn't stop there. He went even further. He said, I'm going to return and I'm going to check on the man and I'll pay any more expenses that you've incurred. And those listening to Jesus' story that day were blown away at how far this man went, his zeal to care for another. And that's the opposite of apathy, to go further with care, compassion, diligence, caring enough to let ourselves be bothered, caring enough to take action, to see and act, and doing more than was expected. And you know, when I'm honest, I have all kinds of apathy, all kinds of apathy towards being a good neighbor, towards loving God more. Those are the big two that God gives us again and again. We see them at the beginning of this parable as well, to love God and love neighbor. And when I'm honest, I can be apathetic about both. Uh, If not out loud, at least in my head all the time, I say things like, oh, my plate is, is too full already. Or I don't know if I could follow that need all the way through, so I better just leave it. Or I couldn't really help. Or, you know, we have limited funds. Or I'm overwhelmed with the needs around us and I wouldn't know where to start. How do I go from apathy to an engagement? How do you go from apathy to zeal? Well, we have to find a way to grow our hearts for compassion, to allow our hearts to be soft, to be movable, to be attentive instead of tuning out God, tuning out the troubles around us with our family, our friends, in our city, in our neighbors. We need to listen by the Holy Spirit with curiosity, 
with compassion. We develop a bigger heart, just like the Grinch in The Grinch Who Stole Christmas, whose heart went from a hard heart, not caring about people, trying to steal Christmas, to his heart of compassion growing. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say, the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And then the true meaning of Christmas came through, and the Grinch found the strength of ten Grinches plus two. That's what we need to counter the sloth for Jesus to change our hearts. And so let me give us three things to help break the apathy in our hearts. I want to give us one prayer one spiritual exercise, and one activity today. So first, the prayer to break apathy is, Lord, break my heart for what breaks your heart, and start praying that daily. When was the last time you were moved with compassion? When is the last time your heart broke a little bit? And men, you can admit it, when is the last time tears welled up in your eyes? For my husband, Joe, it's probably the last time we watched a Disney family movie together. (laughs) When we look at the accounts of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, notice how often Jesus was moved with compassion. And quite often when you see Jesus was moved with compassion, it was for issues of suffering and injustice. We see that when Jesus encountered two blind men, it says he was moved with compassion to help them. When Jesus met an outcast with leprosy, we read he was moved with compassion. When Jesus met a funeral procession for a widowed woman who was now about to bury her only son, scripture tells us Jesus' heart went out to her and he was moved with compassion. It tells us when Jesus saw the confused and the lost crowd with, like sheep without a shepherd, like those that had lost the path, been knocked off the path, Jesus had compassion on them, just like he has compassion on you. When Jesus looked at all the humans, past and present and future, he was moved with compassion and went to the cross so he could know you and save you. The opposite of apathy is Jesus' heart. The opposite of apathy is to have the compassion of Jesus. Compassion that moves out towards the other. Compassion that sees and acts. And if you're a follower of Jesus today, Jesus wants to give you his heart of compassion. To grow your heart three sizes, even in our difficult world, that we would still have soft hearts that get moved regularly with compassion. Well, second is the spiritual exercise to fight apathy. And that's to get around the marginalized, the broken, and the hurting. Rather than running away, rather than crossing on the other side like the priest and the Levite, rather than averting your eyes and and muttering, I don't have time for this, stop and pay attention. That's it. Just stop and pay attention to the person that's hurting around you. When you're scrolling, rather than scrolling right on past that justice issue, stop and look to pay attention to the brokenness in our world, even right here in our own city. Because we counter apathy by letting our hearts be moved, by getting around people and places and stories that expose us to the marginalized, the hurting, the broken. This past week, two hillsiders, Julie and Jenna, on our behalf, went to Beaverbrook School to learn more about the the breakfast and lunch program there that we were giving to through Love Day. And way to go. It's just amazing that we raised over $6,000 and did all that work yesterday. So thank you. That was a lot of hard work. And you can still give, if you'd like to, to the lunch program at the Welcome Center today. Um, So Jenna and Julie went to Beaverbrook School last week on our behalf to check out what was happening there, and their hearts were moved with compassion as they heard the stories of the kids at Beaverbrook School. 
Stories of new immigrant families, when they go to the school to enroll their kids and they're told, oh, your kid will get breakfast and lunch, and the look of relief on the parents' faces. Stories of kids being invited to go to the clothing closet and get a new outfit away from the eyes of their peers. Stories of kids who had never been to the Moncton Zoo or Centennial Park and now are going on field trips there and are so excited. It's like better than Disney World for them. And it was so clear when I talked to Julie and Jenna that their hearts had grown three sizes that day. As they met these kids and heard their stories, their hearts of compassion grew. And so grow your heart three sizes by getting around issues of justice. And third and finally, the activity to break apathy. The activity to break apathy is to be the ant rather than the sluggard or the sloth. In Proverbs 6, we're told, go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. The ant doesn't store up its provisions in one gigantic move of one giant uh, hero sandwich like I try to do when I try to bring all the groceries in from the car in one gigantic trip. The ant stores up its provisions little by little, crumb by crumb, again and again. And so that's what I want us to do. So I want to invite you today to pick one area of your life where you want to develop your muscle of compassion, your care muscle, and be the ant. Pick one area where you want to go more from apathy to more care. And just pick one area. I don't want you to be overwhelmed. So pick one area where you want to go from apathy to care. Maybe it's in your relationship with God. Maybe it's in a relationship with a certain family member. Maybe it's in an area at work, a skill you want to develop in or a character trait you want to develop. Maybe it's in exercise or health. Maybe it's an engagement with a justice issue or with one of our local or global partners. So just pick one area and jot it down on your sermon notes or on your phone. And then I want to give you a superpower to go from apathy to engagement in that one area. So are you ready for the superpower? You ready? Okay. It's consistency. I know, you're blown away. Few realize the power of consistency. But it's the difference maker to overcome apathy in any area of our lives. It's the value of prioritizing week after week, year after year, the same thing in your calendar. You know, the good things in life often take work and persistence. If you talk to any star athlete, any star musician, I guarantee it wasn't just talent that got them there. It was this superpower of consistency. Week after week, the hours they invested in developing a skill. And we want a closer relationship with God. We want a 50-year marriage. We want our mortgage paid off. We want our, our kids to have a good relationship with us when they're adults. We want bodies like the people we see on TikTok and Instagram. Well, we don't get any of those things without using this superpower of consistency. I want you to look at this calendar with me this morning. And if I do something just one time, it's not going to have much effect. So say to Joe, my husband Joe, I was going to say, okay, Joe, I'll take you out on a date night together once a year. That's going to have little effect. If I say, I'm going to go to the gym one time this month, or I say, I'm going to read my Bible one time a year, that's going to have little effect. And often we give up too soon. We say, oh, I went three times to the gym, and we give up too soon. And we say, that didn't work. I tried. Well, you haven't used the superpower of consistency. Watch what happens when week after week you dedicate to going on a date night with your spouse and you start to see the difference it makes. 
or week after week, you dedicate to volunteering in the kids' ministry here at Hillside, and you start to build relationships with the kids, and you see the difference that it makes. Or you dedicate to reading your Bible every single day, and you begin to see the difference that it makes with your relationship with God. Or in your family, you begin to say, we're gonna make sure We eat supper together at least twice a week, and you do that week after week after week. You'll start to see a difference. And the Home Point Conference is gonna be great next Sunday afternoon because it's gonna teach us some of the habits that we can build into our home week after week that will build faith into our homes. So I hope to see you at the Home Point Conference next week. But you have the superpower of consistency at your disposal to overcome apathy. And it it makes the power of the cumulative effect take effect. That over time, people see you really do care. You really do love them and want to make a difference in that justice issue because you were consistent week after week. And the Bible uses another word for the opposite of apathy, and it's the word zeal. Isn't that a great word? Zeal. It's being a person that others could say about you, oh yeah, they're zealous about me. I know it because they consistently show up week after week. And Paul's prayer for the believers in Romans 12, 11 was never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. And so that's my prayer for you as you work on that one thing you identified where you want to develop your care muscle, that you would never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. May sloth be banished from your heart, and may your heart grow three sizes as you use the superpower of consistency. Then the world will see that you love them and God loves them. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us so deeply that you are never apathetic towards us, but you're full of compassion and always move towards us. God, I pray especially for anyone listening today online or in the room that has felt like the world hasn't cared about them. God, I pray that they would know you care deeply and move towards them and give them your love and your time and attention. And God, we pray that you would banish the sin of sloth from us. God, we pray that you would grow our hearts three sizes and make us a zealous people for the things that really matter, for our love for you and our love for one another. God, we pray that as we become consistent people, others would see that we love them and love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please stand with us if you're able and let's sing together.
you and all that we do, that you would continue to enlarge our hearts for others. God, would you help us to have a soft heart and answer your call. In your name we pray, amen. Are you glad you came to church today? Amen. And you know, every Sunday uh, we talk about, you know, really our desire is to have 52 fantastic Sundays. Every single Sunday matters, and it's fantastic when we allow our hearts to be moved by the things that move the heart of Christ. And I believe that the Lord really has stirred up in our hearts today through the worship, through the message, and through just being together. And now it behooves all of us to just take that next step, right? And to move from, uh, you know, from apathy to engagement. And man, during COVID, there's been a lot of things that can make us apathetic, but we just need to get more engaged and exercise that superpower of consistency. Amen? And so every Sunday, the consistency of worshiping God and making that a priority and, uh, and, and the other ways to serve and to be Jesus uh, in our community beyond our walls. I want to thank everybody for coming here today. And uh, I want to mention that if you do have a heavy heart, because we know life can be really, really hard, please don't leave without having someone pray with you. Our prayer team is available in the prayer room at the back of the auditorium or online. A prayer host would love to pray with you um, right now. And um, also want to mention, if you're here for the first time, we're so grateful that you're here. Please stop by the Welcome Center in the lobby. We have a gift we'd love to give you. And if you're online, just put the word, I'm new, the words, I'm new in the chat, and we would love to send you a gift for being with us today. And you know, I just want to say the reason we're able to do all that we do to, to, to you know, be a force for good both within and beyond the walls of the church is because of the superpower of consistency, the consistent generosity of so many of you who facilitate the ministry we do together. So I want to say thank you to that. And I know many of you give online and maybe if God's prompted you, maybe you haven't done that yet, you can just go online and give online. And some of you give um, in the room, in the auditorium by using our giving boxes at the back of the room. And I uh, just want to mention that that is available as well. And so, you know, let's just seek to be consistent as we worship God, as we partner with Him, as we work together, as we pray and be Jesus to one another. Thanks for coming today. Don't forget your kids, for those of you who are parents. And, uh, you know, take a moment and say hello to someone. Man, there's a lot of folks here today. Reach out and say hello to someone maybe you haven't seen for a while. And uh, go in peace, everyone, and we'll see you next Sunday. Bye now. <laughs>